So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll, we'll get this started as we, as we noted, we wanted to start at 7 uh, shortly with, uh, with a welcome and some introductory remarks. And uh, I'm going to ask the uh, Director of International Education here at the college, uh, Ambassador Eugene Bursu, uh, to bring her welcome and the introductory remarks. Ambassador Bursu. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Dr. Rudolph Krupp, President of this college, Medgar of this college, on behalf of the Provost, Dr. Augustine Okorege, on behalf of my good friend here, Dean Terrence Blackman, and all the hardworking people at Medgar of this college, it is my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you here to this intimate conversation with our guest of honor. I am particularly pleased to welcome uh, some people that I see in the audience here. I wish I knew everyone, but I don't. I want to say a special welcome to the guys, Council General, who's sitting there. Madam, welcome. I heard Terrence refer to a lady as Madam President. I don't know. What you president of? <laughs> I welcome you in your capacity as president. <laughs> well, um, let me say this: that um, it, it really is an honor for me to welcome uh, Vice Chancellor Ivor Griffith here today. And I'll tell you why. There's two reasons why. <clears throat> Sometime around 1998. The United Nations and the World Bank came out with a report on crime in the Caribbean. And I, I was astounded to see that two Caribbean countries were <coughs> leading the world in per capita crime. It was Trinidad, number one, and Jamaica, number three. Uh, I decided that I'd like to do something about it by organizing uh, conference to look into this whole issue of crime in the Caribbean. Um, I made it clear that I didn't want a police convention. It was not about locking up people and putting them in jail. It was about trying to understand the sociology of crime in our region. There's a region of the world that is supposedly idyllic, climate, the environment, everything is ideal for relaxation and a good life, and yet we are leading the world in crime. I wanted to get to the bottom of that. I decided to organize a preparatory workshop and um, do it in the form of a breakfast. Uh, I decided to invite the Chancellor, sorry, the Provost of York College and a long shot, because I really didn't know if he would accept my invitation for just a, pre a break of <coughs> meeting. And lo and behold, who was there, prompt and sitting with us as if he was one of the boys. It was Dr. Ivan Alberti. I could never forget that morning, not only the contents of what you shared with us, but the way you interacted with us as if it was no big deal for you to leave your, your college and come here and share with us. I really appreciate that. And it's one of those things that stuck in my memory. Thank you very much. I also want to recall, and I hope that every one of you here who are Guyanese would accept that with a degree of pride. Last April, the president Myself and uh, Dr. Maria de Longoria visited um, Guyana. And on our itinerary was a welcome dinner by the Vice Chancellor. And ladies and gentlemen, let me say this to you it was a dinner. <laughs> it was first class all the week. All the week. And, uh, you know, the Vice Chancellor don't know how to do anything if it's not first class. And so again, Mr. Vice Chancellor, I want to say thank you very much for creating these great impressions in my mind. It has enriched me as a person. And so 
in my humble way, I'm just thrilled to be able to stand here and welcome you to have this chat with us here this evening. Thank you very much for, for being here. Welcome to Medley of Islam. Thank you, Ambassador Pursu. Uh, it's, it's, it's often, it's important when you have these things you can say who the, who the folks are. Sometimes we, you know, we hear the anecdotes, but we don't, we don't often say it. So I thought I'd first, in, my, in introducing our, our, our guest this evening, uh, Professor Ivo Lloyd Griffin, I would, I would say just a little bit about his bio, and I sort of uh, added this to our program. But nonetheless, I think it's important to, uh, to sort of read it into the right work, so to speak. Uh, Professor Ivlaw Lloyd Griffith was appointed the 10th Principal and Vice Chancellor of the University of Vienna in June 2016, having served earlier as Executive in Residence at the University of Albany, State of New York College, and the 9th President of Fort Valley State University in Georgia, where he he sort of led the right-sizing of the educational and economic enterprise, uh, focusing on growing enrollment, enhancing the academic profile, uh, controlling spending, launching honors and undergraduate research programs, and initiating a feasibility study uh, to establish a school of entrepreneurship business innovation. Uh, professor Griffith is a tenured professor of political science, and he served from 2007 2013 as provost and senior vice president at York College in New York, where notable achievements included growing the full-time faculty by 30%, reorganizing academic affairs into schools of business and information systems, arts and sciences, and health sciences and professional programs, and enhancing research and scholarship by creating uh, the provost lectures the Distinguished Scholars Lectures, and the Undergraduate Research Program. Professor Griffith is a University of Vienna alumnus. Uh, he was the first person to graduate with distinction in political science. He holds a Master's of Arts from Long Island University here in New York, and both a Master's of Philosophy and a doctoral degree in political science uh, from the City University of New York. He is also a graduate of the Harvard Graduate School of Education Program in Educational Leadership, and this is part of what we want to talk with him tonight about. And he's also a graduate of the Millennium Leadership Institute of the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. Professor Griffith is an expert on Caribbean and hemispheric security, uh, drugs and crime. He is the originator of the concept of geo-narcotics, which emerged in the early 1990s as a way to study the complex relationships between drugs, geography, power, and politics. And it was first outlined in Canada's leading international affairs scholarly magazine, uh, From the Cold War Geopolitics to the Post-Cold War Geonarchotics. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome to our Professor Ivor. or so, and then we will sit down and continue that conversation. Uh, so he'll give us, he'll set the stage for us, and then we'll, then we'll complete that conversation. So, great. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I've got a first request, and that is to ask everyone in the back row to come forward. Find a seat in the front. You know, you want to escape before the working comes in. You know, I used to say to students when I talk here regularly in the U.S. that too many of our folks struggle to find a seat in front. Why do we want to sit in the back when we have an opportunity to sit in front? I want to begin by thanking and applauding the black one as well as a colleague from the Alumni and Friends of the University of Guyana for not only organizing the session, but for also having some healthy food and other things to go with it. The last time I was in this room, two years ago, 
that journey where you take for granted by virtue of being away for a while, and now you've got to manage not only standards, but the standards and things that are so elementary in the faith of this a battle we should not have to fight. <coughs> but I want to say that there are several points of pride along the way. I think when you will have looked at the two and a half years, actually 33 months of the Project Renaissance, there is much for which we have to be proud. Part of what the journey is all about is not only a journey that will lead to certain product enhancement of outcomes, but a journey where process is as much as important as a product. It's a cultural shift in many respects. We have been so adrift from the centerpiece of what excellence and standards have been that getting process is just as important as a product. But if you want to identify a couple of tangible outcomes of the journey's pursuits, I brought a few copies and I'm, I'm delighted to see that, you know, there's a great minds think alike. Yeah, well, but they always say, fools that were You know, that's in the fools category. <laughs> we decided to put together a little, we'll have enough for everyone, a little brochure that's capturing some of the physical enhancements in the last 33 months makes a difference. Simple things that you would take for granted. I remember going, going to school at the University of the 70s, the largest, single largest lecture hall is what is now called the George Walker Lecture Theater. It used to be hot a long time. And with global warming, it is even hotter. So I decided to air condition the whole facility. People think that I'm inventing something new. It is such a fundamental, simple thing to create a comfort in the largest classroom space to give it also the smaller to be. So some things which are captured here as points of pride should not be a point of pride in the, in the, 19, the 21st century, but it's a manifestation of the extent to which the neglect has been so significant. Uh, that a Cambridge, a good friend of many of ours was home last year, and he was he was noticing my year one scorecard of things which some of which should not be points of pride, like not having horses and sheep grow on the campus, <laughs> <laughs> like not having all so many stray dogs around. Simple things that would enable the climate, the ambiance for learning. Uh, a good friend of mine was our, also our distinguished artist in residence, Dave Martins, posted a Facebook message saying, I'm going to ask the vice chancellor how he can get the road at the UG paved. I've been trying to get my road paved for a long time. Paving the road, creating a car park creating the facilities that would make life for students and their staff useful and worthy of the long to come here. So I'm delighted that we've been able to significantly make a difference. We've not been able to solve all the problems, and some of the problems are not available to quick fixes. It's going to take a journey. It's not a sprint. But I'm delighted that people in this room, people not in this room, people in the diaspora at large, have been contributing to that journey in so many ways that you will not be. I've often used something that's simple as an example of how the diaspora is contributing to what the Renaissance journey is all about. And I've used Karen Wharton as a reference. You would see sometimes public announcements from the Department of Public Relations. Is that Department of Public Relations is Karen Wharton? In the diaspora, knowing what her limitations are to PR, said, sort of, I will do the marketing. And so the point I'm trying to make is that the value and the contribution of people in Ghana and out of Ghana is something that I take as a point of pride and want to thank colleagues for the vision and collective One of the sociological realities of our society also, and it's not unique to Ghana is that our nation still has a love-hate relationship with the diaspora. 
And I've experienced that stuff, hate relationships, and my personal needs. Not only being told I'm not the real guy, he is. <laughs> but also being told that um, I'm trying to impose too many American values. And I said, I am just as Chinese as you. And there is nothing wrong with having standards. There is absolutely nothing wrong with being not comfortable with mediocrity. And so I want to express my appreciation to colleagues in the diaspora. The entire diaspora, not just North America, but lots of Guyanese and non Guyanese who helped us in significant ways behind the scenes. We just talking to Eugene, not Eugene, he was Elan. He had a wonderful visit a couple of weeks ago from the Deputy Minister of Natural Resources in South Africa, Mr. Ali Fong. His coming to us was a function of someone in the diaspora, albeit in the diplomatic court, Kenrick Hunt. Kenrick was home for Christmas, came to my party, and he's been working behind the scenes to let him position us. So when Kenrick heard it was a team coming to Ghana, we behind the scenes ensured that there was a visit to the university to find out how can South Africa in the area of mining help us. We have a pleasant <coughs> Department of Geological and Petroleum and Geological Engineering, significant to which is our mining program that is needed. And so we'll be getting assistance from the South Africans in helping to show that. The point I'm trying to make, colleagues, is that sometimes you don't see the manifest contribution. It's behind the scenes. It's not product. It's process. But I value all those contributions, no matter how small they are, or how big they are. I'll end on this note because we want to make it a conversation. Some of the contributions are personal and enabling me to be away from the family and do things and not have the family neglected. And I want to think about someone who is not here, someone who is here at that very personal level, nothing to make it with it, family life. Be a life that is not one of, of sad and regret. I will tell you story. And Leland Walker, who at a very personal level, come to be sure that things in the family home can happen, even though I'm not there when there are emergencies. So there are various levels at which people have been helping me and helping our nation and helping our university in ways in which you don't have to make a big sing song about it. But I value those contributions, individual, institutional, personal, and so on. You will see in that list of achievements in the scorecard, year one, something that was a signally important project of mine in my first year, to regain the accreditation of that school of medicine. We were able to do it. We now have a four-year accreditation to be going back up in 2021. And that, for me, is a signal point of pride in the years to get the flagship program of our university uh, back on, on track. We have a challenge with that in that not only is the entire university portfolio of programs way beyond the economic cost of the event, but the medicine, the dentistry, the optometry, those allied health in particular, they cost much more to run than we charge in the students. So we're going to have to make some tough decisions going forward, not only to right size our programmatic offerings generally, but to significantly increase the tuition. And the significant increase in that tuition is something that students understand. Because we have non accredited medical schools in Ghana charging four times as much, four times more than what we charge. But for a number of reasons, historic and political, there is a reluctance to have that differential tuition in the way in which we have some cost efficiency. But we're going to have to go there. We're going to have to go there with medicine. We're going to have to go there with dentistry, with optometry, with nursing, with public health, with law. Because it's just not economical to keep subsidizing the programs in a way in which, given the overall thrust of things, it is no longer a tenable proposition to do. I'll end in 
is hope. The journey has just begun. Process and product of the intent to enable the university and the university to benefit the society will take more than three years. And so I have been very thankful for my wife's support in allowing me to say to the university community, I shall be seeking a new contract. Now some of you have been following the news recently. already know that some people don't want me to be there for another three years. Uh, but I said, let's see what happens. People want salary increase without performance. People want salary increase without doing their jobs. And I say, salary increase is important. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You've got to look at continuous improvement. The University of Ghana and the unions of the University of Ghana have not had a collective labor agreement since 1994. How can you, in 2019, operate on the basis of just guesstimate and practice without the basis for legality? And I'm saying, let's put on the conversation table performance in addition to salaries. Let's put on the conversation table a collective labor agreement so we can have predictability in what the relationship shall be. And so I want to pause on that note of thanks and express willingness for continued support and look forward to that continuing support with you. Now I know that Terence and Addison and others who organize this may not have been inclined to want you to leave your tangible support to the Vice Chancellor's Fund for you leave. But uh, even though our treasurer is not here, I'm sure that he would not be on my foot give them any contributions that people want to make. So I'll call it. So the idea is that we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to open this up as a conversation. Uh, what I what I thought I'd do is take the prerogative of the moderator to to sort of perhaps start the question. So one of, one of the things that struck me is that, you know, we, you, you've gone on this journey, uh, you know, broadly you're, you're kind of, you know, increasing capital investment in the institution, you know, you're looking at academic enhancements, uh, you're discussing issues of economic viability, uh, you're engaging the diaspora, and, 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 and there is some resistance to that. And, and so, the question, there, there are two questions. So, so one, I think you, you just articulated that in, in, a, in, a, in a way this resistance is a, is, is a function of not being able to kind of manage or, or, you know, folks are not seeing, really understanding the importance of excellence for the project and, and the importance of, you know, if you're going to make an omelet, you have to break an egg. Uh, so that's that's one part of it. But I'm wondering, you know, your catchphrase is sort of dreaming and doing. I'm wondering when Professor Eichel Lloyd Griffith dreams about what this university looks like 20 years later. What's what's the dream? You know, what what is the thing that you know? I think maybe your faculty and your staff. You know, the thing that they can kind of pull after that. Well, let me answer that question in two ways. And the first is to offer a context comment on what I think is the watermark of the question. <coughs> and the watermark of the question that I would offer is the dreaming and doing that I have introduced is not dreaming and doing outside of what academies do. It is largely dreaming and doing that is not within the portfolio of knowledge to the guy. And so, some people think that I'm creating these crazy ideas. It is just that I'm trying to normalize within that. Mm -hmm. What is normal in most universities in the Caribbean, in North America? 
So it's helping, part of the dreaming and doing is helping people to understand that there's a paradigm shift we're introducing. And in the paradigm shift, you've got to take the willing, you've got to be willing to take risks to go to places you've not gone before. And that has not always been appreciated. But let me get to the second part, which is the essence of your question. I outlined in my values and vision statement <coughs> what I call quoting Martin Luther King Jr. He gave a speech right here in New York in 1962. He talked about, he was talking about Vietnam. He talked about the fierce urgency of now. And I use that phrase in trying to articulate what is the necessity for the university to embrace that urgency of now. And the urgency of now is one in which I say, and I quote to the gentleman who I've long admired for, for decades, a guy called Robinson Artebor. You might remember that Robinson Artebor became famous in a variety of respects, but his big fame came in 1913. When he was the first non European to get the Nobel Prize. And he also became famous in 1919 when he repudiated the British effort to give him a knighthood. I had the opportunity of uh, lecturing last year at a university in the Nizam and visiting in, in, in Calcutta. In Calcutta. But Tagore said, among other things, you can't cross the sea simply by standing and staring at the water. You've got to make some bold decisions and choices. And for me, the urgency of now and the trajectory that Guyana is on requires the university to have some big dreams yeah. and big doing. Yeah. If you always want to pick the low hanging fruit and be comfortable, I'll give you a very good example of. Well, I have to invoke another gem that I admire. In the introduction you gave, you mentioned what I started at Fort Valley State, and that is a school of entrepreneurship. The same gentleman who led that team to do the feasibility study at Fort Valley, but after that, Fort Valley said, I, go, I want to help you wherever you go. So I brought him to Guyana. He's not a guy in East, Georgia. He led a feasibility team. When it came to the governing body approving that business school, a member of the governing body said to me, Excellency, aren't you dreaming too big to have a business school? <laughs> I am sitting there saying, So I said, let me tell you what Michelangelo said years ago. He said, our greatest challenge is not aiming high and missing our goal. It is always aiming low and reaching them. We don't have the luxury of always low hanging fruit. We've got to aim high, have big dreams, and pursue them. And I think in the context of what Guyana means, the University of Ghana doesn't have the luxury <coughs> of not dreaming big. Last year we had the first entrepreneurship conference. I said something there which I did not realize that impacted so many young folk until a couple of weeks ago. I talked about the business school as part of the trust of the Renaissance in the context of what Jim Collins called his beehives, having big, hairy, audacious goals. Yeah. This was July of last year. A couple of weeks ago, a young graduate who is now a leading young woman in terms of entrepreneurship, trying to get young people to save and to manage their money. We had a Turkan and Tate talks looking at money matters and she was on the panel. She later sent me a text. She said, I can read it to you if I find it just now. She said, I, said, I want to thank you for what you said last year, July. So he said, what? 
He said, you told us to have big theory on Asian souls. I decided I want a second world of educating 11,000 young people and not giving them money back. She said, it never occurred to me that it is possible to have big goals until you said, why not dream big? So this young woman now, uh, president of her company, dynamic young entrepreneur, took seriously what I've been saying in the campus, of the campus, we have to have big goals. And the big goals will mean big investments. The investments don't have to come only from the government. Which is part of what I've been saying, we've got to broaden the revenue pie, broaden the investment pie. We've got to bring in government and ask them for more. We've also got to bring in the business community and ask them to invest. We've got to reach out to our alumni and friends and say, how can you pay forward by giving back? And so having said that, I would like to, at the end of 20 years, long after I'm gone, see a University of Ghana that is characterized by at least three things. Be the place of choice, first thoughts, for Guyanese who want to invest in their tertiary education in a variety of respects. No. We have seven faculties in a school of business. We have now 130 different programs. Guyana should be the place where people feel so confident about the credibility of what they offer that they don't use as their first choice the offshore schools. If you go to the National Accreditation Council listing, you see 17 different offshore schools. And I was in Texas two weeks ago. Two more are coming. The all thing is bringing a lot of people coming. The University of Ghana needs to strengthen what we do and how we do it to be that first place of choice. But a university in a nation like Guyana cannot limit itself only to teaching. It's got to be a fulcrum around which research happens. And my staff told me not to bring back any of these books that I brought forth. They need to be sold here tonight. Well, uh, we've established the University of Ghana Press. This is the first book. We decided that the press is not only going to be producing books, you've got to get into the journals business. There's a team headed by Professor Alum Percy Gibson from Florida International. He's also one of those indefatigable supporters of mine, heading up a project to create a new journal on the Guyana Shield. Guyana, Suriname, Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, we start to go French Guyana. So, we need to be the place around which research revolves. We've got some outstanding features of Guyana, which the University of Guyana needs to leverage. Our biodiversity. We have the basis for tropical medicine. That's right. That's right. We're not in that game as yet. We need to be accentuating the research. But the research is not only to be accentuated and supported by what the lecturers do, sponsor, as well as the sponsor. We'll be having on the 10th, 11th, and 12th of this coming month the third undergraduate research conferences. We've got to get the students involved. Florida International, I created an undergraduate research program. York College, I created it one. Radisson Univer Radisson Radford University, created one. Fort Valley State, University of Bath. We've got to get young students of their freshman year, first year, excited about research. And I just saw an email a couple of minutes ago saying, we've got four of our students that have to present the research in Georgia. And I said to the team, we've got some ambassadors in Georgia. We can avoid paying for hotel and have them spend time hosted by these families. We have a group of four students going to Germany to present their research, the International Congress on Student Research. We've got to energize the students, not only the masters and PhD students, but the undergraduates in respect of your field. And for the second conference last year, as we had done elsewhere, I was starting these programs. We said, look, We've got to capture the whole panoply of creativity. And 
so we had a wonderful inclusion of the arts, painting, sculpture, allowing the students to showcase that creativity. So I think the second thing I'd like to see the university become is a beacon for research, not only by the lecturers, by the professors, but by students. Part of what we did um, along with Conservation International and Arizona State University, <coughs> we're building a partnership. I led a team to Arizona State University last November. Part of the interrelationship is that they sent a team a couple of weeks ago. We said, why don't we have, in addition to those students coming with their lecture, some of our students. So I met the team. One of them, we have four biology students. Never occurred to them until this project that they were good enough to do research. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I said, you can't wait until we get to the master's level. So the excitement of the research is there. So I would say that was the second thing that I would look forward to see in, in, in the Here's the final thing. The University of Guyana, along with the University of West Indies, are signatories in the treaty creating CARICOM as associate institutions. But over the years, as the University of Ghana moved itself to be more internal, limiting, it fell by the wayside. This university needs to get back as an engine of agency in the region. We are part of the Criminal Exams Council. Many people don't know that. In the council, the University of Ghana Vice Chancellor is a designated member of the exam executive body. But there are so many other entities at the regional level where should, we should be pulling our weight in more significant ways, and we're not. That is a function both of what happens at the university and what happens at the government. Because now, Jerry Captain did not know this is being live stream. Uh, Don't say anything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we are, we are our own worst And so it has to be a function of what university does and what people beyond what the university people beyond the university what they do can enable the university to have that leveraging at the beyond Guyana level. Some of it is there in the architecture. It is just over time we have fallen by the wayside by our own position of our own position. So that's a very long way no, to put it no, 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 I, no, I think, I think, well, mathematicians will say there are three things. The first thing is that you want this institution to be an institution of choice for Guyanese. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is that you want this institution to be a place that creates knowledge that supports the Guyanese project. Mm -hmm. and, and the third is that you want this institution to be an institution that is, that, that, that is a player in the regional sense, yep. so that, Absolutely. And, and I think this is very important. And there are there, there are a number of <coughs> there are a number of issues regionally that impact what happens in Guyana, mm -hmm. as uh, Ambassador Pursu uh, referred to in his opening remarks. And perhaps maybe I can give, as I can tap into your your academic expertise. Uh, Ambassador Pursu noted the the, the conference on crime mm -hmm. and. I think currently we had this conversation sometime very recently. In the top 25 of you know really terrible crime statistics, a large number of Caribbean countries uh, appear as as, as leading in in, in, in this arena. So so you get yeah. So so I wanted to sort of say, well, how do you see? It? I mean, this is something that you know we, we've talked about this before. You know, Guyana is a country with relatively small population, and, and maybe this is in some way leading to this kind of normalization of, of uh, normalization of, I don't want to say mediocrity, but the normalization of, of, of lower standards. And, and how do you see the university in that context? How do you see the university coming to, you know, coming to be this change agent in the society more broadly? You know, I, I know the Turkine team talk. So could you maybe say a bit about the Turkine team mm -hmm. and you know, their possible impact on, on the socioeconomic and the culture of the uh, 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 mm -hmm. Well, I'll say three things. Coming back.
back to my point for the university, there's another level that want to be in a teaching institution. It has got to be an institution that does research. It has got to be an institution that does research that is both policy relevant and theoretical. And it's in a policy relevant domain where the value of the embrace by the polity, polity both in the policy makers and in the broad civic society, when they feel comfortable that you've got the credibility and work to say, help me on this. It is not unique to Guyana, it is true of many societies in the Caribbean and Latin America, where there's a predilection to turn to the outside to get advice, even though it may be people on the inside. But that predilection will reduce over time if your credibility and value rise. So the onus is on us to not only do the research but share it. The onus is on us to market the, cap market the capabilities. I've been on a journey to let's enhance the website, let's tell people who we are. You know, we're fighting about the University of Ghana of an image and a brand of 20 years that is not necessarily a positive brand. But unless we tell people the things you're doing, they may be inclined to hold on to that negative brand that they know of that has been the dominant narrative. So, the Torkan and Tain talk, the conversations of non society, the Renaissance lecture, <coughs> are all part of that enhancing the brand while enabling people in society to see the value of the university over and above the teaching. Allow people to see the importance of building the partnerships. Each one of those sort of annotated talks, we'll be having number 17, I think, next month, is a partnership. We say private sector, government, academics, international organizations, let's have your investment collectively by co-sponsorship. Let's bring your value and your talent and your expertise to the conversation. And the Turkan and Tim talks in particular have become an expected staple. Expected staple. I asked, we had a, we had a conversation on marijuana recently. So I asked the guy who manages the live stream, I said, what is our average followership? He said, for that one, we have 7,000 people. Across the diaspora, not just in Guyana. We started the Artist in Residence program. He's Wake in London, who's the first Artist in Residence. Dave Martin, who's the second. Dave gave a performance at the Bad Stand in December. I could not be there, I was in New York, but I was following it online. It was wonderful to see Guyanese in Bolivia, in Canada in the U.S., in the U.K., commenting this. Two days later on, I got an email from Dave's sister in Canada. Remember, he had a sister. Thanking me for giving her little brother <laughs> <laughs> to have his talent be appreciated by God. So the point I'm making is that those enrichment events, we call them public engagement events, are part of enabling the society to value the university in ways in which that valuation was not there in a positive way. Allows the broader society, within Ghana and outside of Ghana, to see what are the connection possibilities for future research, to see what are the connection possibilities for new programs. We've had a process, Lands and Affairs Commission, because of things and those sort of things. Can you help us with a program on X? We have now the first situation last year of a Land management diploma. It came out of <laughs> came out of the conversation of law society. Uh, our minister Greenwich, I invited him to do something similar to what he did here. The, the talk he gave of the talk about the in the world at one stage. He was so excited about the whole thing, but it got undermined by the parliamentary debate. And so when he called at maybe four, four to say I'm still stuck, the room was packed. I said, I'm not going to turn this into a no then. I pulled together a panel. And by the way, we called him, you know, we really need to be this panel. 
Imagine Ram Nasim was an Islam, and said, Ram, you need to be an Mikiko Tanaka, United Nations resident, said, Mikiko, can you join? It was a wonderful conversation about Ghana and the war stage. If you mean to say me, maybe it's a good thing the Prime Minister didn't show up, because we had, a, we had a broader, richer discourse than if you heard just from him. So the collective value of those events, We've tried to, we've done a couple of them outside of Georgetown, but you know that there are challenges once you get out of Georgetown. Uh, there's a wonderful new hotel in Amsterdam. We're hoping that that becomes a place now where we can go out of the Little Rock place. Uh, but I've committed that we're going to need to do some of them in Let Them, not Rumor, in Bartica, across, across the society. But I'm delighted that the live streaming has been reaching a broader than Guyana and a broader than Georgetown. So, so I'll take the frogs with the moderator to begin to open up for questions. But I wanted to ask one more, but maybe not. Maybe talking not. too much, man. No, no, no. <laughs> but I, I can't ask. No, that. We'll talk. So uh, we'll, we'll start with you, Randy Barrett. Yeah, thank you. Um, you so let's stand up for me. Hi, everyone. Um, this is great. This is um, my question has to do with data analytics. Um, we're in the big data age, everything is data analytics. Um, I can probably say this with 100% confidence that Exxon Mobil knows Guyana probably better than the government knows Guyana because of data and analytics. Um, how do you, how do you uh, plan to introduce data, data science, data, data um, uh, analysis, um, analytics? into the university so that we can be more of a data-driven economy, a data-driven country where decisions are not made by just a whim but with evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and one last thing, I'm going to put a plug in on the conversations in the Law and Society. Um, April 16th, um, I'll be talking about the Sovereign Wealth Fund, so definitely stay tuned at 5 p.m. I'm waiting. Part of, oh, so I'm Rennie Paris. Um, I've been in finance and, and investment for about 15 years. Currently, going, currently finishing up the Wharton School of Business, and um, I've worked with major companies like JP Morgan, S&P, and um, venture firms. Very important issue, very good comment. Remember, you might recall what Mark Twain said years ago. He said that there is this thing called lies. Uh, there is this thing called allies, and then there is this thing called statistics. But notwithstanding what Mark Green said, we have a collective challenge, and it's no consolation to say it's not just a guy in a child, it's a guy in a child, of having the basis for evidence based decision making. It's no consolation to say that it is a broader than university challenge. And there were at least two ways in which, and I don't know that we've attempted yet significantly enough, but we've got to go there. The first approach is to have the infrastructure, not only to assemble, but to analyze for that. We don't have much of that in many cases. On the financial side, on the basic heuristics of decision-making side, women are fancy, so we have, to, we have to be the infrastructure. But we also have to have an acclamation, it's a kind of a paradigm shift, that once the data are presented and are analyzed, they will be used. That is often the litmus test of the value of investing time and effort in collecting and analyzing the data. Who uses it? And so it's got to be the wisdom of the broader society, policy in both private and public sectors, that you've got to invest in infrastructure. Some of the infrastructure is human capital. Some of the infrastructure is data management systems. Uh, one of the things we did when we went to Arizona State University, we went to one of their data labs, and we've asked them to help us get one of those at the zero cost to us. <laughs> uh, so that would be part of the infrastructure and human capital. But you're absolutely right. We're not there yet. And you're also absolutely right that 
some entities know much more about us than we know about ourselves. And sometimes some folks, even inside the CIA, what the CIA does is a lot of it is open sources. We've got to have a willingness on the part of private and public sector officials to begin to invest confidence in the data that we have. To. We had a few weeks ago the outstanding, I don't know if some of you followed it, second C.Y. Thomas Distinguished Lecture by Roger Hussein from UN. He amassed a variety of data from a variety of sources. And it was wonderful at one hand, and disconcerting on the other hand, to hear him say that some of the people who we checked with him were questioning the, the accuracy and validity of your own data. So if you don't have any confidence in your own data, <laughs> how do you expect others to have confidence? So we've got a confidence issue, which is a cultural issue, but we've got an infrastructure issue. And again, we don't have the luxury of building infrastructure and waiting for the confidence of the human capital. You've got a little bit of each. And I'm reminded now that when I get back, I have to ask the lead person on that group project, when are we getting this thing from ASC? Uh, go ahead. So on the back, and then we'll come to you. So state your name, and, and then the question. I am concerned about the the existing culture at the university of Vienna. Even though you've been doing your thing, trying to make things happen, you just push back. And, and you can find it in every you can find it in every in every little corner, in every little spot in the university. And I ask this, uh, you know, I, I question this because I was at the university to do some research on, on land, uh, ancestral land. You mm -hmm. talk about, you may mention, but infrastructure. I think one of the things that we have to do is to start training the university staff to change themselves to welcome this age of technology and the new culture that is, that is swinging across uh, globalization. Because in a second I can get as much information on how to deal with garbage. And, and it's so effective that I don't have to go far to get an And I think um, at the university where we have staff who want more money, I think uh, we've got to introduce some, 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 some reorganization of how they, how they have been educated and how they deliver service to, 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 the, to, to the public. Mm -hmm. now, the other thing that I want to, the other question I want to, you know, that was a statement, and I want to ask the question, why is it that uh, technology transfer, technology and culture, and culture transfer to the young, we have such a hard time but the green back and the barrier is welcome. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to understand what is really happening in Miami that, that the diaspora is so heated that, that when you see, uh, I don't know, when it shows up, you know, you see negative. I took you, I took uh, the vice chancellor to take off. And it was emancipation. It was a period of emancipation. I was shocked. The question. The question is, why? Why is it? What, what are the roots of the, the, what? the who is do, Who's doing it? Who's doing it? So we'll pull it. And, and I'm not saying that. What I want to say is that you know, there's nothing more that an individual from outside can come now and do. I don't do anything more in the I'm just looking after my personal. But I'm asking the question. What is the pushback or blueback? Well, I would have been shocked, Terence, if Bernard had made a statement or asked a question without the ticket being fired. Mm -hmm. 
some of these young people were dancing in ways that I never know she can dance like that. Yeah. It'll just allow people to have a social side. And for me, we've got to find a way to keep those, to keep the Christmas party, let people have a celebration. So it is not only whatever you might do formally on saying, here is what we need to do. It's how do you give a sense of appreciation to people? So that they will see themselves as ambassadors and servants in the positive sense of the word, rather than a chore that they've got to go through and be whipped if they don't perform the chore. The technology transfer is an issue. And part of the challenge, of, again, it's not, it's not a consolation to say it's a challenge of the university, it's a challenge in a broader society. Technology transfer has two critical components to it if you want to make investment in the long term. You've got to invest in not only getting the technology, but you've got to invest in the training and the human capital to use it appropriately. And there are so many cases, and many of us who are part of efforts, relief efforts, have given things to countries where it's there, not being used because there is no adequate training to use equipment. And then when equipment is broken down, the maintenance and parts, if you don't invest in that part, getting the front end is necessary, but not sufficient. You've got to train people how to use it appropriately. And then you've got to find a way to enable the sustainability of what is transferred when it comes to maintenance, when it comes to repairs. And many of us in this room have had not so pleasant experiences with regard to that aspect. So it's, a, it's not a, as simple as selling stuff. It is how do you enable the train so that we can use it. Can you ask anyone to exist? Uh, you're asking about people to exist. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, for someone who has been working in the trenches in terms of give back to um, the secondary school, what is the university doing to engage the leadership at the high school level, at the primary school level, Ministry of Education, Teachers College, so that you can uh, achieve this excellence change? How is, how is the university engaging at a lower level for societal change? Excellent question. One of the things I have said to folks both on and off campus is that the phase urgency of now that we have at the university is not a phase urgency of now limited to the university. But I've got to be mindful of the purview of my portfolio. I can solve everybody's problems. I can solve people's problems. You need to do this. Yes, but who's going to give money to do it? You need to do that. So yes, there are things, given the connectivity between primary, secondary, and tertiary, there are things that need to be done that I, it is not within my portfolio to solve all those problems. I'll tell you two that we've begun to build a synergy as well. Last year, June, I think it was, I convened a consultation on writing. We have a terrible problem with writing in Guyana. At the university. Some people may not want me to say it, but that's a reality. We brought into the conversation, into education at various levels. We brought the private sector. We brought the CPC. We said, we've got to have a collective conversation about how the university does its part of how other elements in the structure do their part. That conversation was a two-day conversation that led to recommendations of next steps. Some of the next steps are beyond the purview of the university. I have to leave those to those relevant domains. Some of them have to do with what we need to do at the university. And we've begun to work on those critical would be establishment of writing clinics students. Give you another one. Last year, June, as we began to have the conversation about preparing for oil and gas, I hosted the president of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. 
we launched a program in partnership with UTT, the Associate in Science and Petroleum Engineering. Uh, so I hosted him and I took the opportunity of bringing in one forum the heads of all the technical institutes. And I proposed a consortium that would link all the technical institutes and it was a learning on our part. We didn't know they had so many technical institutes yet. And we established a consortium, a higher education consortium on engineering and mining. They elected me as a founding president. The idea is to how to synergize, because we know that in oil and gas, some of the skills needed are not going to be universal skills. They're going to be the technical institutes. But we also know that the technical institutes have their limitations we want to be able to collectively put our heads together. Some of what they will need is some of their lectures coming to complete their bachelor's and master's at the university. How to create a seamless transition for them to come. Mm -hmm. So that consortium, we're having a meeting next week, I think, the 25th, is an expression of how, given the connectivity between the university and other sectors, there are things that we can do that I am not going to be in the business of trying to solve everybody's problems. Uh, so we, we, we want one of the sites. So. Yeah, but that's a bit. How does it change the quality of acceptance of these changes that you are engineering right now? Mm -hmm. It's truly really positive. I think, by and large, very positive. And one of the interesting things about the student acceptance, and I've given two specific examples. Of the, part of the defense secretary on the George Bush who talked about Rumsfeld. No, Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld. Known unknowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Some of these students just did not know. And they're happy to be embracing positive change. Some of them knew because they have gone either on visits or completed degrees of other institutions and now see that what we have having in Ghana is really high. So by and large, positive. I'll give you two examples. When I proposed in 2017 tuition increases, so we could no longer afford the business model, we've got to increase tuition. We had several working groups put a proposal to me students on the working group were upset. Anybody would be upset about tuition going up. So I said, look, why don't we have you meet with the bursar and the registrar, get the data, see what the income and what the expenditure is, and then you come back with a proposal. The students came back with a proposal that essentially I accepted with one week. So if you allow them to be part of the process, you see their investment of interest and the investment of time and energy and wanted to make possible. So I'm by and large very happy with the student institution. When we were planning the oil and gas programs, I distinctly remember where we were sitting, a student who was representing the engineering students in the meeting I had on campus with the president of UNT. When I floated the idea that we are not going to be able to afford the luxury of having this new engineering program be at the regular engineering cost. The student said, I shall see you correct because when we graduate with engineering, we can make a lot of money. So the student should be able to pay. There is, if you bring them involved, get them involved in the process, and help them to see the information, get their critique. Yes, you're going to have some pushback. But by and large, I've been pleased with the student engagement and the student response. I'll come to that and store it next to you. Ah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I, I missed. I missed. So first, all right. Yeah. Hazelwood. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Hazelwood. Uh, <coughs> Hazelwood and uh, then let me store it. Can you give me curiosity? Quick status report. Quick status report and projections of the future for medical and medical students. Um, you refer to <coughs> 
You referred to accreditation and so forth. I'm not familiar with what the crediting body mm -hmm. uh, you use in uh, uh, yeah, that information. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, just so that you, my curiosity arises from the fact that I uh, uh, created the National Oral Health Care System for Ghana mm -hmm. about 25, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I uh, haven't really followed up. Yeah. <clears throat> well, there is an accreditation body for the entire Caribbean, English speaking, Spanish speaking, French speaking, called CAMHP, Caribbean Association of Allied Health. And it started with accreditation of medicine. It is going beyond medicine. Now it has gone to dentistry, it's going to go to optometry. <coughs> Institutions that graduate students that are not accredited are limited in the geographic locale in which they are able to practice unless they pass the boards of the respective other jurisdictions. Or in the case of the United States, they pass the boards at the federal level. We were able to, UG School of Medicine was accredited but lost accreditation in 2012 be able to get it back in 2017. It's for four years. It's an annual review. We decided to go beyond medicine to test our method with dentistry. We were not successful in the first out. And what is true of medicine and it is true of dentistry is that the areas of improvement are both on the university side and on the government side. The primary clinical facilities for medicine and for dentistry are government institutions. That's what we had a meeting with the Minister of Public Health in November or December last year to ask her to broaden the institutions where clinical attachments can be held beyond the DPHC, Western Mara, and so on. The principal dental clinical facility for the dentistry is the Cherry Jagan Dental Clinic. Both the university and the ministry made enhancements, but we have not met the bar. The bar has to do with essentially infrastructure enhancements that still need to be done, but also faculty special, specializations. They've got about 70 specializations in dentistry. We are not there yet. But we've got another year. You can't go back up until two years. So we're going to use the intervening period to get ourselves ready so that we go back up. We can not only really meet the scale of our cabbage fee is the region wide accreditation. Uh, so I think we have let this short and uh, someone else and then, and then we'll come to you. Okay. Um, I'm going to speak on the infrastructure. But more so in the physical infrastructure. Why are there plans for technology to assist in the development of the country's policy? So water, roads, electricity, and also what are the research programs in technology they are you can use materials from to help in that therapy. And another question, I don't I don't know if Gates still exists at the Dynasty yeah. Station of Professional Engineers. What is their association with the engineering department of the NAP? And what are the safety requirements being taught in technology to ensure that the structure is properly built and the programs used for the enhance the longevity of where we are? Good question. I want to start with the last aspect first. November last year, we graduated a single large group of civil and environmental engineers, including a group of almost 30 women, first time 
start to be with it. And I met the group early in the year and I said to them, the onus is on you not only to be technically competent, but to have integrity. I've been preaching the values of respect, integrity, and excellence. And the more I see reports about corruption, including in the professional zone, the more I see reports about sloppy work done, the famous case of the Cato School in the East Kingdom, we've got to reinforce the value of doing it right, right for the right reason. I cannot speak with confidence about what the curriculum design in the that is, but it is something that I will be arguing for as a common denominator throughout all four years. My worry, and I've seen it in other jurisdictions, including the United States, we know that once the oil money comes, there's going to be a need to spend it on infrastructure. Minister Patterson, Minister Gaskin, Minister Kathy Hughes, myself, and Nigel Hughes are part of the team in Houston Capricity. And Minister Flag Patterson spoke eloquently about the government's plan for investment in infrastructure. That will put the pressure on the university not only to have, and we really don't produce enough civil, electrical, mechanical engineers. But once that money begins to flow, the investment in infrastructure begins to happen, we are not going to be able to make the cut if we keep the trajectory of investment. My 2016 values and vision statement which may not be actualized while I'm vice president. We need to have a new campus focusing on energy and mining. I've named Linden as a place to be appropriate for that. We need to invest, you know, Torcan might look that it has a lot of land, but moving beyond Torcan. My worry is not only the, the, the you're crunching so much into that 115 acres. But we are along the coast, which is sitting at the edge of a climate change precipice. And I've said, build a new, part of my big dream, build a new campus focusing on energy and mining, engineering. Mm -hmm. So right now, I think next week we'll be having another Schlumberger doing something with us with technology. And the investments are coming small, but they're not significant enough to make the kind of impact that I think are needed. Sometimes people fault me for trying to dream too much, dream too big. But you've got to be asking for big investments in engineering if you want to have sustainable returns on the investment. And we're not there yet. One of the things that uh, kind of is a regret of mine regarding the October to December 21 is that it has slowed a lot of things down and it has put a cloud on a lot of things. We had a proposal and had a first meeting with the Director of Energy, Mark, Dr. Mark Bynum, about a request we had made to invest in engineering. First meeting, second meeting, hasn't gone very much far. But your concern is recognized. We need to do more to invest not only in engineering and technology, but in the sciences. I was disappointed uh, that one of the things that came out, when I visited India last year, I asked a number of institutions to help us on a critical shortage area that we have in society, that is, that is physics. Um, Physics teachers in the high schools are not there, math teachers, science teachers, and the High Commissioner to India, Dr. Paul, that identified that as fine, dynamic young physicists. 
ready to come to Ghana. She got a better offer in Switzerland. So, but we still have that journey. The point I'm making is that the investment in engineering has also got to be in those allied areas in physics, in the math, in the chemistry, in biology. And so that journey is still continuing. I'll take my prerogative and go into Longford first, and then, uh, because we haven't had one. So you were going to work out there, and then, and then, and then, I'll work. Um, first, I, I want to congratulate you on the run of our region. And I know very well. Whenever I go to Ghana, I used to go there and visit, and we try to help there. One of the institutions are a building you have resurrected or reconstructed in the library. That's a sole point of my visiting university, as you know, students, that paper for us. That's where you do your research and your homework and all that. Having said that, I, the question I want to ask is how can the students do research now? that the infrastructure is there. How can the students do the research if you have no publication? Or if you need publications, say, in energy, mining, science, business, all the other disciplines, how can this for help in uh, not only staffing, but in putting those research building um, blocks in the Library, so that students have a library, do their homework, and all that. Because without the library, where would students go? Mm -hmm. I know that a lot of students use, use the internet. They do the research, not enough. They sit there collecting the opportunities from the library area. It lends itself to learning, discussion, and all those things. Mm -hmm. So, my question is how can the world help?
training capabilities to use. Part of what Florida International benefits from is some high-speed technology link to Brazil. We're exploring whether we can link Diana into that portal so that the technology is speed the bandwidth and not the use that we've got to contend with. The reality is that libraries are critical or physical, but they're also increasingly technology-mediated online. So I would say in response to your direct question about how the diaspora can help, the diaspora can subscribe to online journal subscriptions. And we have that in the case of one of our medical graduates who has been paying for the online subscription for a particular journal. That is one practical way you can do. Another practical way you can do it is help with some of the equipment. We had a group of Guyanese, only one of whom is a UG graduate from Maryland. Computers. Mohammed Shahabuddin's son, also a UG graduate of law, significant donation of equipment and books. So there are a variety of ways in which the diaspora can make their contributions unknown. The, the CDB effort is going, going forward slower than I. The procurement rules kind of create a certain amount of lethargy, but the library is one of our areas of interest. We had an expansion of the Burbis Library. In, we don't have enough for everyone, but you will see a little portion of the Burbis Library expansion because my thinking is that in the context of the one university, we can only focus on the Torquem Library, and so we've been, we've been doing things to enhance. But library is a critical area, and not only for instruction, but also for research. As you push, as you push down on open research, you're going to have to create the opportunity for the bases for research being available in the library, or accessible to the library, portals from the library. Tell us the critical standard that you it's available. It's available. And I, I want to publicly thank the library staff that has been working on the very frank edition over the last several years. And is there a list or something that you have that, um, as far as research, um, physical research, and as far as technology that you need to know in the library? I don't have a list with you, but I can have a list with you back for the Our financial field alumni engagement office there by Professor Mohammed manages those lists, and we can tell you what's needed from technology, what's needed from the library. It is part of that is allowed there by you to say, we will help you with this, we will help you with that. Good so that, that list can be provided. Sure that a take away from this. We will actually grab that list and disseminate it to uh, so the folks over here. Uh, Mr. Burke, and then. Good evening, Dr. How are you? Are you? How are you? I, see you. I see you in the chancel here from the box. Oh, the box. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have a question that has three short parts. One, um, you may know that a number of us are working on um, a new movement, which movement for that. That will be launched shortly. Um, and in preparation for that, we've had extensive consultation and surveys throughout the country. And we've come up with a charter, a new charter, um, which I'm sure will be engaged, will be engaging you shortly. Um, there are three things in the charter that I'm happy um, you're here I can ask about. One is <coughs> One of the recommendations coming from the charter is the abolition of tuition at UG. And as you know, that is a constitutional right in Guyana, abolished by the PDP. Um, it's going to be a hot topic in the campaign, I know that. Now, I would like to know what your thoughts are with regard to that. And second, another recommendation coming out of um, in the charter would be there's significant concern about the capacity of the university um, to cater for courses 
um, that are relevant or trade that will be relevant for the emerging economy. And we touched on, on some of it with the Linden proposal and campus and so on. And PhD programs, masters in certain areas that impact an emerging modern economy. And then the third thing is, which is most, which is most po as popular as the abolition of um, tuition, is the establishment of a community college system in Ghana to be managed by the University of um, And to that extent, they proposed, and I'm happy you spoke about concerning, they proposed the merging of Critchlow, Burroughs, Theatre Gill, and so on to form a, uh, a college, community college of arts. President's College to become a college for science and so on, and um, GITC, GNIC, GTI, and ISUCO to become an engineering, community college engineering and those occasional subjects. So, I mean, I'm amazed at the brilliance of the young people in Ghana when I look at the proposals that they have made. And I'm pretty sure it's, it, it, it's going to inspire the whole population. And, uh, in advance of that um, coming out, I wanted to know your talk. Could be three, three sets of important issues. The business of university free education, which is a trying to accomplish this, as quite rightly said, is a reflection of one of those realities in societies of managing contradictions. <laughs> and what the Constitution postulates in free education is not the only contradiction that society has been managing, or some would say not managing. But I want to offer a cautionary note about free tuition. If free tuition is defined only as the absence of payment by students of tuition, or whether primary or secondary, especially in this case university, without looking to make the investments in those critical elements to make the university function, to be a sad reality for that. Investment has got to be made in the infrastructure. Investment has got to be made in the equipment. Investment has got to be made in research, in better salaries and emoluments overall for academic and non-academic staff. But I would also caution the rush to free tuition by asking, let's take a look at societies where in the recent times there has been that model, and let's see what happened to those models. I referenced earlier that the wonderful, and hopefully some people here would have seen it, C.Y. Thomas Distinguished Lecture by Roger Hussein. His whole lecture had to do with what are some of the issues that Guyana will have to manage with this oil money? And he addressed the issue of free tuition. And he cited Trinidad the experience that is a lesson for Guyana not to follow. In giving free tuition, and I would say all the proponents of it need to pause and look at lessons learned from other jurisdictions for it first. The University of Ghana Student Society had a series of debates recently. I was able to attend the second one. The subject of debate was that same free university tuition. And it was remarkable to hear some of the students who, were, who went in thinking that it's a good thing. One day, once they had a chance to hear the other side, that's what they said, all the other and party. Hear the other side. Once they were able to hear the other side, they said, oh, I'm not so sure this thing. So the jury is still out as to whether there is not so much utility, <coughs> but necessity for free tuition in managing this contradiction. The jury is still out for me. I am one of several people in this, here, in this room, perhaps, who benefited from free university tuition all the way up to the year of national service. But then, the free tuition by itself, if you look at the return on the investment by the people who are beneficiaries, unless you have controls, 
you can have a recurrence of some what happened in the night in the eighties and the nineties, where the human capital goes. You're educated and they go. But let me tell you what it's like to happen. I've said more than once, I had an interesting experience in 97 when I was doing a series of book launches. I had a book written called Drugs and Security, Sovereignty on the Sea. When we were in Aruba, the head of the prisons in Aruba said to me, you know, Professor Griffin, this drug trafficking thing is giving my prison wardens a wonderful education. So what do you mean? He said, we are arresting people and imprisoning them from countries we never knew existed. Once the oil becomes available in Guyana, there are going to be people coming to Guyana from countries that Guyana never knew existed. And the question will be, are they also entitled to free? The proposal addresses that. Good. So there are a number of elements that have to be factored in. How do you say to a family that comes with the young children, some of whom are teenage years, how do you preclude them from this constitutional right to be <coughs> citizens from the future? So I will leave that one there. You're absolutely right, and this is one of the things we began to look at the university. Say, what might be, looking at the trajectory of the society, what might we need to begin to introduce as new programs? It is that that led us to establish the School of Entrepreneurship and Business Innovation. And I said to the feasibility team, as we do the feasibility in the School of Business, we need to see what our connectivity is with the oil that's coming. We know that once oil and gas come, hot areas are going to be logistics and supply chain management. So one of the new degrees we introduced, not only for oil and gas, but because there was that link with logistics and supply chain management. Last October the 25th, to be exact, we launched an Institute for Food and Efficient Security. The worry given the experience of Nigeria, Trinidad, Venezuela, is that when they all come, if you don't have a studied approach, you'll have a neglect of agriculture. So we said we need to be among the places that have a voice in saying we can neglect agriculture. So we have a new degree starting this semester. Food science. We have a new degree in petroleum engineering masters, an associate degree, an associate level. So we've got to find a way to ask the question, what's on the horizon? What in response to the society's constituencies we need to be doing? We launched a new degree this semester on youth development, youth work and development, because we found the response of the society has been not only are a number of youth in need of skills enhancement, but a number of people who work with young people, they themselves need to be adequately skilled in that. And it was wonderful, we had a launching symposium for a youth degree, youth development degree, and one for the food science, and one for the engineering. And for the engineering, we brought, I brought the principal and pro by a chance from St. Augustine. He was happy. I got an email from a friend in Jamaica saying, well, how did you get to Henry Beckles and Brian Copeland to come to your campus the same day? That will happen to you. I so, said, well, I got some really good <laughs> uh, Hillary is a good friend of way back, and he came to deliver the Noel Menees lecture. And Brian is a friend of more recent vintage, but I said, Brian, I need you to come and talk about this is a wonderful lecture. Again, saying some of what Guyana needs to do is not do what Trinidad did. Let me come to your third area. I think it would be valuable to have a community college network, but not managed by the University of Guyana. You need to create an independence of the university, a relationship with, but not a management by the community college, even in times of bounty, they can be resource competition. And if you set up the university to be as the arbiter for the resource of that community college network, you set up the stage for conflict that accentuates beyond competition, beyond collaboration. So it should be some either independent entity that manages that, or the Ministry of Education. But I think there is value in having that network 
and not only establishing it, but resourcing it. And one follow-up. Uh, one follow-up, and uh, as Warden, and you know, I just, and it's slipping away. <laughs> 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 so the, 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 the major concern yeah. that, that's led to that also, which is very popular, is we've, in, because of the tuition, we've eliminated poor people from going to the university. How is the society going to deal with that going forward? Because we've already shut a lot of people I'll give you two responses to that, but that, the evidence does not suggest the veracity of what you say. I mentioned earlier that there are 17 offshore schools. You know who they serve with? Guyanese who pay two or three times the tuition to go there. So the pocketbook availability or non-availability is not a compelling argument if you look at the evidence. But here's the other thing. But is that from people who are poor and abilities will you change? Yes. We talk about those that don't. Well, that's what the second thing. Those who don't have a loan facility for them to apply and get. And I remember the same time we came down, we came down in June 2016. The government, and people started believing me, the government published a list of defaulters. Some of them big lawyers, big doctors. Some of them were mad at me. I love how you I said. I'm not a one of the problems of this. Not about you. She has nothing to do with that loan agency. We just, the beneficiaries, so there's a loan facility of generous proportion that significantly has been abused. Uh, it's taken as if it's a grant and people just don't pay back. The government tried to impose some controls, but that loan facility creates an access by people who would otherwise not be able to access. So the loan ability, uh, what I think would be helpful or necessary as an investment in education, is to broaden that, not simply make free tuition, but you know the reality in the guy from China, I've said it, I've seen it in other parts of, parts of, of Asia, and we experienced it in the 80s and 90s in Ghana. You make something completely free, the valuation of it is not as high as it. When you put in something, I started doing something at Thorne International. When we would have students going on these trips, I would say, let them pay for at least one meal. Let them pay for the transportation from the airport because you give them everything free. And it became important after the second experience where we had paid for the travel. Paper hotels, and the day before, the agreement, I can't go anymore. Why? I don't know if you're a friend. The frivolous things. Well, we couldn't get the money because we paid for the travel. We paid for the hotel, get back to the hotel. So I started having them sign a contract that says, here is how much, and you're going to pay for at least one thing. And so I would say, make the loan facility available for a broader group. But Believe me, there are people who pay two, three, four times what the UG charges for those private schools. And I was laughing driving down home stretch on Caritas Avenue the other day. See one of the offshore schools boasting about their the, the top respected private medical school. But I didn't see anything that says not accredited. <laughs> University of Ghana Medical School is the only accredited medical school. Yeah. But there are many people who come, Guyanese and non-Guyanese. I had a group of a combination of Ghana, Ghanaians, Ugandans, and Nigerians. I just got to UB 2016. He came to see me. He wanted to transfer. He said, There's no such thing as transfer. You can't, I don't want to be accused of poaching. They explain the litany of complaints they laid out. So I said, well, we are free and open to application. None of those students met our basic requirements. The guy said, we have the money. I said, it's not about the money. We want to graduate. The doctor is going to be helping people, not hurting them. If you can't pass the chemistry and the math, how are you going to be a doctor? So it is, it is, the evidence is different. 
There are some institutions, they are not as judicious about the standards as they are judicious about the income. And people are paying. But they don't want to pay to usually. Ms. Wharton, you get the last question.
He said, I want to see the books. We provide them all the data. Even though the data show we can't afford, they ask for a 9 and a 10 percent. He said, we can't afford 9 and 10 percent. All we can afford is 3, 4 percent. And so started the protests. We met with the Ministry of Labor. The Ministry of Labor said, well, in the context of not, not having a collective bargaining agreement, you've got to follow the laws of Guyana that says, if you have an industrial dispute, it's got to be bilateral, conciliation, and arbitration. And while you're doing that, you can't have any strikes and protests. They want that. Matter of fact, today they had a, a 12, 12 people were picketing. Even though the Ministry of Labor sent them a letter yesterday saying that you're precluded from industrial action, you have to talk. So where it stands right now is that after January of this year, when we showed them the books and said there is no possibility, the fiscal space is not there for 9 10 percent. Let's talk about 2019. My worry is that 2019 will have to build on 2018. If we can't afford anything but 3 4 percent, how are we going to find 9 and 10 percent? And then when 2019 conversation comes, you're going to want 10 and 11 percent. So the pro chancellor, Ms. General, retired to the same, established a panel, union administration council members. One collective meeting where he proposed a joint statement, they said, I want a joint statement. That has fallen apart. So the pro chancellor put out a statement yesterday saying that. Efforts on his part, on the council's part, to bring some consensus have fallen apart, and they are now supporting the vice chancellor's approach for conciliation. I hope that good sense prevails and people recognize that it is not helping you to go protesting. You gotta sit down. When you go protest, the protest doesn't give you the nine or ten percent, even one percent. You've got to come back and have the conversation. They want an audit. They said, fine, let's have the audit. The audit will show we don't have the ability for a 9 and 10 percent. So where it stands right now is we've turned the matter over to the Ministry of Labor for Conciliation. We will see what the Ministry is able to do. But I'm hoping that good sense prevails. But here's the reality. I am thankful that most of the staff, academic and administrative, are doing their job. You have a union with a pretend membership. Most of the people see the wisdom of the progress we're making. You see the wisdom of only being able to offer something that you can afford. Here's the reality of 2019. The budget from the government of Ghana to the University of Ghana is 42% less than the request. So we're right now trying to manage 42% less than the requested. You know, you're going to come and ask for 8 and 9% for last year. In the context of a fiscal space for this year, which we already know, I hope that wisdom prevails. Of course, my contract comes to an end in a few months. There is a campaign now to get rid of Griffin. Yeah. It's part of it today. Griffin must go. But um, I've expressed my interest in a new contract. We shall see what happens. But I will not see the vice chancellor. Well, we talk about that outline. <laughs> so, so, so. Together, the organization, which is headed by uh, Alison Steed, the alumni and friends of the University of Vienna, were quite instrumental in getting the vice chancellor to hear for this conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I think Alison, I wanted to give Alison an opportunity to uh, say a few closing words and, and perhaps uh, help the vice chancellor in some way. I'm hoping. Uh, so, so Alison Steed, you know, you know.